career is very important in setting your reference point about how fish are doing, right? So if you were you started like him in the early in the early 70s, you had a picture of what fish is in the ocean, the size of how plentiful they are, based on the literature and, and your knowledge at the time. And this his 1970 reference point informs how he thinks about fish research and the research he has and so on and so forth. So for somebody who started his or her career in the 1900, they also have their own reference point. And then for you guys, starting around this time, you have your own reference point. And what he argued for is that with time, the baselines, depending on where you start, keeps going down, ramping down. So earlier scientists had the view of the ocean and the water contains something like this, kind of large fish. If you are in Newfoundland, you are used to caught all over the place, you don't even need to, to go catch them, they jump into your boat, as they say, right? And today, if you are starting your science, your reference point is quite low, and that is what you use. And he argues that that actually has an impact on the research you do, what you come up with, and your recommendations for management. So it has impact on management. And unfortunately, it seems that with time, it is a shrinking baseline, you know. You have less and less. And hey, if, I, if you talk about fish being bigger than human beings in many places now, young scientists will laugh at you. So you're talking nonsense. What are you talking? It's not just real. And that was the, the, the theme of the paper. So it's become very influential because it captures an image that most people can really relate to. And like I said, it's been turning into all sorts of things from movies to, to books. We just published a book last year, I think, on the shifting baseline. It's the title based on this various case studies and others like me, I looked at this from economics. So it's, it's quite a movement actually. And then the movie was done by somebody in Hollywood actually. And when they did the initial screening, I and Daniel were invited to one there. And it was funny, one of the things that I remember in the movie is they have a portion where they go out on the street interviewing people. Right? Have you heard about shifting baseline? And then people are thinking, these are people on the street. What does it mean? And I remember vividly one scene, there's this African-American guy walking on the street. It's quite endowed in terms of um, weight, right? So he's walking on the street, they interview and say, Sir, have you, have you heard about the concept shifting baseline? So what, shifting baseline? Is it when your waist is expanding and expanding and expanding? <laughs> so that's the concept of shifting baseline, right? So, so you have all this funny thing, you're just trying to get to people before they tell you what it means. So I think you can find that on the web if you just uh, Google uh, shifting baseline, there are tons of things in there. Yeah. Okay? So that's, uh, you want to add something? I think I can just stick with this one page paper. Yeah. It's really uh, an amazing thing. And, and, and many of our PhD students, uh, sometimes those who don't really finish on time, a lot of the time this is their excuse and many of my have said we want to do a very solid piece of work, we want to do a big paper, we want to And then I sit back and say, but how do you know before you publish the paper? How do you know your paper is a big one? How do you know it's an influential paper? Actually, you cannot tell, right? In science, you don't decide that. You know, Many of you will soon realize that many of the senior ones have done this. The paper, sometimes you do a paper, you think this is the best paper in the world. You send it out, and the reviewers hate it, editors don't like it, you never get to publish it. You don't decide that, actually. It's your peers who decide that. It's people out of you. So just do it. And that's the kind of paper here. It's amazing. Yeah, so, I think more than 100 years ago, the fishermen complained to the British Parliament that they are less fishers, and they already appointed. Committee, a committee to try and understand why there are less fishes in the sea, and this was at the end of the 19th century, so these complaints are getting really yeah. so. There are also, like we try to reconstruct the climate by proxy, there are many uh, proxies for fisheries or fishes mm -hmm. in the last thousand years. Sort of trying to. Yeah, based on taxes, historic yeah. archaeological sites, <coughs> to reconstruct the, the amount of fishes, different species. Yeah. Jeremy Jackson. Uh, does the name sound mm -hmm. Jeremy 
projects. He does historical reconstructions and they had a big paper and some science about this where they look thousands of years trying to recast how it used to be, right? Brave science. This is the kind of science I call brave science. Many of my economists will not touch that with a long pole. How do you even know what happened 10 years ago? We are talking about a thousand years, right? But, um, okay, so that's the shift in the like concept. Just so. now, we turn our attention to game theory. And uh, it's going to be a, a quick introduction to games and game theory. Why is game theory a useful framework for analyzing environmental problems? Many of us in this field, we argue that it is a useful tool, and you know, I'll try to explain why we think so. Game theoretic modeling of fisheries, how this is applied to fisheries, and some general comments and remarks. So, what is a game? If I had asked you this question before showing you, you, or you guys would tell me all sorts of things, right? Monopoly and all that. So, so, but this is a formal, this is a really formal area in mathematics, actually. It's not an economic area that economists like the other scientists we borrow and talk. So, Ken Binmore, one of the leading economists in this field, he, he says that any activity involving two or more individuals, okay? So you have two or more individuals. Once you are not dealing with only yourself. So you have two or more individuals, each of whom recognizes that the outcome for himself or herself depends not only on his own actions, but also actions of others. So if you are in this situation, and there are more than just you, and you know that what I do will impact somebody else, and what they do will impact me, you are already in the game situation. So we are in the game situation in this classroom, maybe, right? And you can just think of it. We, we work together and benefit most from it, or we don't, and we don't benefit anything. Right? So, so far the class has been a very good game in terms of cooperative game, right? We share ideas, we ask questions, we respect each other, you know, it's nice. So that's a, a game is a description of strategic interaction, and that is in italics, and that's the key point. It's strategic interaction that includes the constraints on the actions that players can take. So you are, you are thinking strategically, you are not just into this for without thinking. So you think of what if I do this one would that person do and so on and so forth. And you are not working free, there are constraints, there are things you are not doing again. Think of any game, there are always rules of the game, right? So, you need to. Uh, what is game theory? There are many definitions of this in the literature. You can see these are posts that I've taken from the literature. So, <coughs> game theory is a, a multi person decision theory or the analysis of conflicts and rivalry. You know, when game theory started, actually, it was seen purely in terms of conflict. This is, this is a part of mathematics and science which was developed actually by the U.S. Army. They developed this for, for war games actually, you know. So, so it's always about conflict, right? If we're going to war, how do we do it? If we do this, what will other people do? And so it's all about competition, but it does involve into other things as you will see. Uh, it is a mathematical tool for analyzing strategic interaction between and among individuals you know, yesterday there was a question about agents, you know. This could be called agents, individuals, they're just individuals, people working as a group can be an individual, a group, a country, uh, among individuals who may be persons, friends, stakeholders, nations, and so on. So it's a wide definition of an individual in that sense. Yeah. Okay, so it's a strategic analysis of the interaction. And what we mean by strategic interaction of the field uh, you consider the following situation just to give you a picture of what strategic interaction is. When you have a few firms that dominate the market, so you have a few firms that dominate the market. In BC, six companies dominate the salmon farming business. So most of them are the wage. So, so six. So, so they have the market, six, six companies. So if you have that, then there's opportunity for strategic interaction between the players. <laughs> or a few group of individuals have fishing rights to a fish stock. So if you have a fish stock that is shared by more than an entity and 
this can be countries, it can be different groups in the country, then, then, then there is opportunity for strategic behavior. Or countries have to make an agreement on governmental policy. Kyoto is a big one, right? So when you go there, when all these nations meet, and Kyoto and then it's trying to come to an agreement on greenhouse gases, these are all strategic players, actually. And they go there, have their goals, close to their chest, and they know if I do this, the other country will do that. So it's a very big game situation there. Then each individual has to consider the others' reactions and expectations with respect to their own decisions. So when you read in the newspaper, the US says, we will agree if China or India does that. And that's already the game is being played there, right? And so on and so forth. So when people have modeled this, trying to explain why we don't have an agreement, for example. So, in theory, it has a lot of application. Now, to describe a game, this is the basic structure of any game. If you look at the literature, if anybody has developed a game on fishing, then these elements are there. So you have to decide who are the players, who are the agents, right? If you are talking about salmon in the Pacific, they migrate, through the US, Canada, Alaska, back in to the ocean and back. Who are the players? So you have the US and Canada right away. Okay. Then within the US, you can have California, Washington State, right? Oregon, mm -hmm. Alaska, and in Canada, you have the host. You have to define who are those involved in this game. Okay? And then you have to describe the constraints. What are the limitations? The natural limitations, right? Fish has to be in your water so you can eat it or pack it. So you have to define the constraints. What actions and strategies can each player really deploy? What is possible? What is not possible to have to say? What information sets do you have? What do you know about the fish? What do you know about the other player, right? And then outcomes and solutions. Each game must lead to some outcome. So if you are playing this game, it has to take you somewhere have to have a solution or an outcome. And once you define the solution or outcome, then each player will have something to take home, yeah, the payoffs. So if we agree on Kyoto, what do I take home? If we don't agree, what do I take home? That's your payoff. And that has to be part of it. The, the game description must include all of the above. So any one of you who wants to apply game theory, always think about that. You almost have to have a checklist. <coughs> Right? Then, key assumptions of game theory, and this is where game theory gets into trouble. <coughs> because there are very strong assumptions, and people are acting on that. It's the behavioral economics, like Ingrid said, right? So, each decision maker is rational. So, we're all rational agents, in the sense that he or she is aware of their <coughs> alternatives, so you know all the possibilities around you. And when you don't know, you form expectations. So there's nothing like there's no data. If there's no data, make it up. <laughs> I say this and my students get shocked. Actually, that is life. Right? Do you ever remain in bed because you don't have information? No, you wake up. Life goes on. So if you don't know anything, make estimates. As reasonable as you can. Just tell people what you have done. But don't say, oh, I can't do it. There's no data. No, there's data. Make it up. So form expectations about any animals. And now you have a clear preference, and this is why people want. You, you know exactly what you want and what you don't want. And this is controversial because we all know sometimes we don't really know what we want. <laughs> right? <laughs> what is it? That's the assumption of being human. So, and then once you know this, you choose actions deliberately after some process of optimization. Huh? How many of you optimize, right? Before you decided to come to this course, what model did you use? Can you tell us? What model did you use to make the decision to come? According to game theory, each one of us had some model in our head. We did some process of optimization to decide to be here. Otherwise, you'd be somewhere else, right? Do you agree? Even if you didn't do it formally, most of us didn't do it. But there was some process there. That's the so these assumptions underlie what we call traditional game theory. Now, this, like I said, they are controversial. So, a new branch came up called evolutionary game theory. I'm just telling 
drop it, it's just for you to know. And it came out of biology, actually.